This is your Dairy Commodity Department report from the 1980 Convention of the National Farmers Organization at Cincinnati. First, we have this song and some very interesting words recorded especially for the NFO. It's called Life of a Farmer. here at this time. <laughs> uh, I did hear some of them say that they were going to make uh, reproductions of that. Okay, that's the answer. Well, it's 1030. We'll start the meeting. I want to welcome all of you here and even though I've been around quite a while, there is still some that I met for the first time last night. So I am Ed Graff, the director of the department. And we got news the other day that Hewell Dunn from Kentucky was killed cutting wood. Hewell Dunn had worked for us for many years. I believe he had a milk truck. And in his memory, I'd ask you to stand just for a moment of silent prayer. Amen. There are three of us going to take part in this meeting today, myself, Ted McCarty, Director of Operations, and Al Scott, who is Assistant Director of Operations and in charge of the training program that we have instigated now and which is paying off. And there may not be time for any questions. In fact, I'd prefer not to have questions at this meeting, as Braniff Gran announced yesterday, but after the meeting following this one, which starts at 1 or 1.30, we'll take all the time we want to answer questions or if you wouldn't be here, if you wanted to write them out, uh, we'd be glad to answer them then because it's one thing always or sometimes hurts if you cut people off in a question answer period and we have to do it because of time, but we still feel this is the only time of the year we can get together from all areas of the United States and we want to give you all the information we have. We want to get input from you people. And we do have a room. It's room number 200. They tell me that it'll hold as many people as we got in here that will be available. We'll have someone in there, small groups that you want to come in, individually or whatever, if we can help in any way. 
So after the third meeting, we will have general question and answer. I'll have all the regionals here on the podium with us because there are probably things happening in the area that they would have the answer for that we do not. Yesterday, when I addressed the convention just for a short time, I tried to call attention to that brochure which points out that there is a difference in the National Farmers Organization dairy program and the marketing programs of all the other marketing groups, whether they be cooperatives, whether they be independents. There's a major difference and it has been of concern to me for some time that more of the people more or less look at us the same, as the same type of an organization as a dairy co-op or another marketing group. There is a big difference. The points we tried to establish is for you to look at that there might be just one point in those 16 or 20 that are listed there that really make the difference that would help you in talking to somebody else to get them to come with the National Farmers Organization, put their production into the organization for better bargaining power. My part in this program today is to try and perhaps refresh the memory of some of you and to get the newer and younger members to understand what has happened in the past. I'm happy to say there are new young members because before we're through we'll tell you of the growth that we've had in the dairy department in this past year. Even after we have closed down some areas and we'll tell you why we did that. Last night I had a very pleasant surprise. I don't know the name of the young gentleman but I've forgotten even the name of the farm. Is it Lafayette Acres? Is that young gentleman in the meeting today? Is, is that the name? All right, there is the young gentleman. Would you please stand up, tell us your name? Carl Babbler from Wisconsin. Carl, if I remember this right, you milk about 130 cows. You saw some of the pictures of the farms out here. I was real impressed. Those pictures came in from the various areas and it kind of reminded me of when people used to say, you know, it was a scum of agriculture that belonged to the NFO. I'd like to see them beat some of those pictures of those farms we could see out there. Carl was telling me that he just recently put his milk with the organization and he said it took Art Wittig, who is a new director coming on the board, four years to get him to do it. Well, the reason I'm talking about Carl is because he brought something back to my mind. Do you remember the meeting in Omaha, Nebraska, the convention, when we said, watch the test on your milk? I hope I got this right, Carl. If I'm wrong, you correct me ahead of these people. I don't think you've got a milk check from the NFO yet through the system, have you? Not yet. But Carl did tell me this, that where he had been selling his milk before, he had never gotten a test over 3.75 until after you moved the milk. Then you got a test and it was 3.8. Is that right? So he has had three tests run through the NFO program and he has nothing under 3.9 as of today. Now that's, uh, am I right on that, Carl? And I told Carl last night, do you see how this 3.5 price is deceiving so often? And that is what has kept many farmers from coming into the NFO program. We get that from our staff day in and day out because they simply say, what are you paying? as though we were buying the milk from them. There's a big difference. In my short period of time, I want to go back and refresh the memories, I hope, of some of you who have been with the organization a long time 
to make a point of this difference to the younger people in the audience, those who have come with us recently, there are probably things here that maybe you never heard of. Walt Hackney, I think, hit it right on the nose when he said from the podium the other day, are some of you getting kind of tired? That would bring smiles to some of your faces, and it, it well should. But in thinking it over, I thought he did a tremendous job when he said, have that two young couple stand up. You kind of recognize now why you've been at it this long and why we have a right to be optimistic today but not satisfied with where we are. Back in 1972, from May of 72 to March of 1974, we didn't have much of anything to do, any program established to do anything for dairy farmers but to try and raise the price of milk once we understood that the base price of milk is established in Wisconsin and Minnesota. The base price of milk for all the federal orders in the United States. So that's when we were criticized as being very inefficient, not knowing how to market milk, when we could have let the members' milk go into the plant right next to their farm, very efficient trucking, probably paying as much or more as we could get anywhere else, and we'd load it on a truck and truck it a hundred miles away. When you took the trucking out of it and the inconvenience, the opposition said they don't know how to market milk. But you never heard one of them come out and say that because of that effort, there was an impact on the market that raised the base price of milk for 22 months in a row. Now the real importance of that was raising it in April, May, and June when that tremendous volume was out there and they always said, well, there's just too much milk, the price has got to drop. It didn't drop because of what we were doing, but it took a lot to keep farmers sticking together and get them to understand that we can raise the price of milk as farmers. And it happened. In fact, it went up exactly $3.21 a hundredweight in 22 months. And we challenged everybody to beat our price. And they did it. And it made us look kind of stupid because to the farmer that didn't understand what we were doing and how we were affecting markets, It was hard to believe, but let's go to today. Carl, what did, the, what did the buyer of your milk do immediately when you left? What kind of a premium did he pay? 11 cents? <laughs> Jacked it up 11 cents. One thing that the dairy farmer I know doesn't he doesn't recognize is the impact that one of you can have on the dairy industry in a given area, or two or three of you. There's nobody in this audience at this convention that's got stars in their eyes believing that this is going to be all taken care of in six months and we're going to have cost of production and it's all over. We had those stars in our eyes in 1960s. I did anyhow. It wasn't that easy, but you still have that tremendous impact today when that production comes with the National Farmers Organization. Well, that was the movement of milk that had an, a bargaining impact, and that's the difference, number one, in someone that buys your milk, keeps it right in his plant, makes a profit on it, and then he goes out and tries to tell the producers that the NFO don't know what they're doing. In 1973, I want to talk about the old system rather than individuals. If I mention individuals through cooperatives' names or anything like that, it's not to stand up here and try and run somebody down. It's the old system that we've got to change. Build a new system, let me say that. And that was in 1973 when at federal order hearings, 
the old system actually testified asking to have the price of milk dropped. Was there anybody here that was at the Chicago Federal Order Milk hearings? There's your evidence to the younger ones or those that may have uh, don't remember. They testified, and I've got the prints here. This is a nasty one. Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. This came from a Farmers Union News. AMPI leads the move to stop fluid milk price increases. They took the, the lead to stop the increase in the price of milk. How many of you are marketing to them? Got another one in here somewhere. It says just about the same thing. But the NFO took odds with them. That's the main point. We said we need higher prices. We testified to get higher prices. And it was then that somebody reminded me at a meeting one time that I said, look, you're going to take a bloodbath in prices of milk if something doesn't happen here, if you don't do something. And in April of 1974, through May, June, and July, the bloodbath came about. The drop in the base price of milk, a dollar and eighty-six cents in four months. Any of you remember that one? You bet. Well, what did we do about it? We said it was going to happen, and let's take a look at why it happened. The old system. Turn that on. These are not real plain, but look at those years of 73, point to them, will you, Al? 73 and 74. And up, up on the top, it lists the products. It shows the increase in the imports. For instance, from 72 to 73, we increased from 66 million pounds to 150 million pounds. Is that in milk fat? Uh, uh. All right. And then in 74, dropped back a little bit to 108 million pounds. But look at the other years. That was 3.5 and 2.6 percent of all the production used in the United States that was imported. And we move over that same year to the milk solids non fat, and you see they went from 67 million to 335 and then 216. That was 4% of all used in the United States in 73 and 2.7% in 74. The shocker to me, of course, was butter, and there's a big story back of that one, but I won't take the time to go into it. Imported 55.6 million pounds compared to 0.7 million pounds or 5.5 million pounds the year prior and the year after. And in cheese, which is all, we've always had large imports of cheese, but they increased that from 179 to 229 and to 315. And then the big one was, of course, in the non-fat dry milk, and this should just make every dairy farmer upset, almost as much upset as the system that markets milk for you today and claims they're doing a great job for you on dairy products and then manufacture margarine. Non-fat dry milk went from 1.6 million to 266 point million and 115, nearly 25 percent, nearly a quarter of all the dry milk used in this country had to be imported. Is it any wonder that we could say you're going to take a bloodbath? And that's what the old system did to us. Just remember that. If some of you have any doubts, as once somebody this morning said, I wonder why I joined the NFO. Let me refresh your memories. That's what it cost. I don't know what that could be added up to in dollars and cents to all the dairy farmers in this United States, what happened just right there in four months. Do you know how long it took to get that back? 
It took 13 months to get back what you had lost in three months. It took 13 months of paying. If anybody thinks they pay dearly to belong to the NFO, let them figure that bill up once. See what that cost them. Now, from September of 1975, the base price of milk, and I'm, when I say base, I'm talking about Minnesota Wisconsin series. It was 827, and in January of 1976, it was 890, from 27 to 890. In five months, it had gone up 63 cents. Now that's an average of 12 and a half cents per month. But then in February of 1976, we saw what the old system did to us again when the price of butter dropped 27 and a half cents on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. How many of you remember that one? All right, what did the NFO do for farmers? First of all, we printed up 5,000 of these brochures, and though it's not too plain, it says, Dairyman, can you take a drop in your milk price of a dollar and a half a hundred by spring of 76? If you can, you don't need to read this. 27 and a half cents in two weeks to affect the base price. That's the old system. We called for an investigation in, of the of mercantile exchange, and January 9th, butter prices rose five cents under pressure of the investigation called by the National Farmers Organization. Butter prices, what happened to the base price? That's all, Al. The base price of milk the following month went from eight dollars and a quarter to eight dollars and sixty cents, right back up thirty-five cents. Now, this is what was reprinted in the Farm Journal. It simply said, or this is what they reported, the base price the MW series price, which fluid milk prices are based, moved from February 825 to 860, all in the face of increasing milk production heading into the flush. It embarrassed just about everybody, including the United States Department of Agriculture. Did you get that? It bounced right back. Because 5,000 of those were distributed, we went out, we called the meetings throughout the United States, stop these drops, we've used it successfully twice, and this organization, that's why you joined it, and that's why you're working, and that's why the benefits are here. Nineteen seventy-six in April. The price dropped back to 844, that's following the increase to 860, and it ended up in December at 825. There wasn't much gain over those years. What was beginning to happen in the National Farmers Organization? How many of you saw in your own counties, or maybe it happened to you, where you left the program because we weren't competitive. Do you remember losing some producers around you at least? You bet you do, because we saw the results in Corning, Iowa. We saw the figures, and it was beginning to get scary. We knew at that time that the farmer didn't know why he had joined the National Farmers Organization and we knew at that time that we had people out there that were doing a better job selling their program than we were in selling ours. And they were doing it on the price, whether it was a dime, 15, 25, 35, or 50 cents a hundredweight. But I'm talking of affecting the market price 
50 cents a hundred in a couple of months or three dollars and twenty-one cents over a period of twenty-two months. And being able to do it because of the support of farmers, but when they started to leave, we knew that we had to do something and do something that would turn this thing around. Right now, we're facing something with the farm bill coming up that I don't know how successful we're going to be. We will be working to protect the dairy farm income in every way we possibly can, but you know it's anybody's guess right now just as what's going to happen. The cheap food policy in Washington, D.C. is very evident. In closing the meeting, I need about five or ten minutes just to tell you and show you how it's going to be easy for you to make a choice as to how you feel about the National Farmers Organization program, the old system, and what we're up against with the government and the economy as it is today. But the bright spot, the brightest spot that we have seen for years, and that is when I said yesterday that of 52 weeks, we increased in production 50 of those weeks. There was a couple we held even on. Now by month, we've gained every month. We've set some goals that Al Scott's going into to discuss. And Ted McCarty will tell you about where we stand today, what it looks like as he sees it coming from the industry. And I don't know what you think of as a good gain, but we have never seen a gain like we've seen in our production in this past year since we turned this around, and I see no reason to have it stop now. Because last year, we gained 20% over the production of the year before. And that's something to be pretty proud of among you dairy farmers that put that production together. So I'm going to turn this over to Ted McCarty at this time, tell you what he sees as of right now, then to Al Scott to show you how it was done and in what ways it was done. And the methods are working because the farmers do want what the National Farmers Organization is offering. It's just been our inability to get through to them, but things are looking brighter right now. So I'll turn it over to Ted McCarty at this time. Ed told you as delegates yesterday something. I have to play button Jeff with Ed all the time. I have to bring this thing down. Every time I farm, I have to bring the mic down. He told you yesterday I was going to tell you where we are. I think I can sum it up in a few words. We're in great shape. That's what the people in Washington tell me. The dairy farmers making more money than they ever have in their life. The cost of production is $11.30, according to Mr. Howard Yort, and you're getting an average price of about $12.50. You're making all kinds of money. So why are you here? So that's where we are. We've never been better. Believe that one. Compared to what? To the hog producer who was producing hogs at a cost of $42 and selling them for $28? Yes, we were better. To the grain producer who was going broke? Yes, we were better. So does that mean that we drag all segments of agriculture down to the lowest level of the bankrupt producer? Talk to Washington and that's what they say. So we go in and we argue, hey, you got your guns aimed in the wrong direction. 
don't aim them at the dairy farmer. Figure out how you're going to get the cost of grain up. How are you going to get the price of meat up? Not how you're going to reduce the price of milk to get us in the same position. Yes. When I spoke to you last year about this time, this is my third convention, you're getting approximately a dollar a hundred weight more today than you were a year ago this time. Big deal. So what? Your cost of production has gone up too. Interest rates. Everything you buy is going to continue to go up. Milk production this past year was up about three to three and a half percent over last year. We had in the United States about 127 and a half billion pounds of milk production. Production per cow was up 30 pounds per month. That didn't come from breeding. That came from giving old Bessie two scoops of grain instead of one. That's where it came from. Because we don't get that much in one year through efficiencies in breeding. And we had milk 1% more cows than we did the year before, which means a lot of the marginal producers were still milking them. They're still hanging on. And in the meantime, consumption level of dairy product was down 2%. So everybody's in an uproar. Production's going up, consumption's going down, all the expense of the taxpayer. And that's the story we get when we went to Washington to argue this past fall why they should not decrease the support price. And it was a very serious situation. And they were trying to get a consensus of opinion from the dairy industry. We were invited, after being asked to be invited. <laughs> and they did not have a consensus when they invited us. Because we said, malarkey, no way. The Farm Bill requires you to go to 80% of support, and you're not going to hear us representing dairy farmers saying, we agree you should reduce it to 75. No way. We did not do it. So they did not get a consensus. They were trying, so they backed off of it. Stocks of Commodity Credit Corporation are high. No question about it. But the thing is that in the 30 years that the support program has been in effect, 30 plus, since 1949, the Minnesota-Wisconsin Price Series has exceeded the support price for 26 out of those 30 years. So how much help are we getting out of the support price? In my opinion, and we had consumer representatives at this meeting in Washington, the support price benefits the consumer more than it does the dairy farmer because it stabilizes the price of milk. It assures them an adequate supply at a reasonable price. That's the reason for it. So they're the benefactors of it more than the dairy producer. But then they complain every time it goes up. And we ask them, how about minimum, when minimum wage goes up? Oh, that's fine. 
And if you hear the song we're playing at our dairy booth and so forth, listen to that a little bit. That tells you the story, what the consumers are saying. But we argued on the 105% buyback price, or what the government calls sellback. Because during last spring, we had high milk production. Interest rates were running 20%. Money was tight. It was a slumping economy. Industry could put their inventories into the government, get cash in their pocket, no investment, and buy it back at 5% more than they sold it to the government for. They could not afford to store their own product. And I don't care what we think, industry is going to make a profit. And if the government gives them a way to do it, believe me, they're going to use it, and I don't blame them. It's not their fault. They're using what the government gave them. We have seen instances where quantities of butter last spring were turned over to the government. I have not been able to prove it, but I've got very good suspicions that whole warehouses full of butter were turned over to the government, never left the warehouse, never left the warehouse, and the government paid them storage because the government doesn't have refrigerated facilities. The government paid them storage to store their product and they could look out their back door and watch it. And when they needed it, they bought it back at 5% over. And it cost them a heck of a lot more than that to store it in their own warehouse, particularly at 20% interest. And they're also drawing rent on their own refrigerated facilities. But where do we go? October 1, 105% again. Same old thing. Now, last year, and I've listened to economists so much that sometimes I fall into the realms of using some of their terms. But, and I'm not an economist, I'm a lawyer. I, I put economists at least four steps below lawyers. And that, that might be partial. But uh, an accountant or somewhere is in between. Below. But uh, uh, we had an improved milk feed ratio. There's no question about it. And milk feed ratio is the cost of concentrate that will equal 100 pounds of milk. That was improved, no question about it, because dairy prices went up, grain prices stayed low. So that's where we are. Where are we going in 81? Hold on to your pants, because here we go. I don't know. Okay, first of all, we've got a change of administration. The present farm bill does not expire until September of 1981. So under that farm bill, the last adjustment of 80% is due April 1st. I feel, and I could be wrong, that the present administration that goes in on January 20th is not going to have time to try to amend the present farm bill, and we will see 80% of parity on April 1st. I estimate that that price will be up 30, no, will be up 85 cents to $13.65. Now today, 
The Minnesota-Wisconsin Prize Series for October. November will be announced Friday. Was twelve hours and forty-two cents. Still thirty-eight cents below support. So support requires no one to pay it. It's just a nice figure the government puts out. Is this is what you should pay? But it does not require payment of support price. As you can see, Minnesota, Wisconsin, where the manufacturing plants are, the average price is $12.42, not $12.80. And 80% of support is really not 80% of support. The government and the economists, for convenience sake, I guess, leave out one little word, and that's called equivalent. But they set it at 80% of parity equivalent. And that's a ratio. So if you'll take parity today, which is of $18.80, and take 80% of it, you're going to be about two bucks short. And that comes with that little word equivalent that they don't talk about. So it's a rather expensive word that they leave out. But when we say 80% of parity, in reality, it's about 72%, 73%. So beyond April 1st, I don't know. There's going to be changes, yes. The October 1 price will probably encourage dairy producers to hold on to the marginal cows. With the price going up. Probably continue to feed. But then we got two things coming up now, too, thank goodness, because we're an all commodity organization. We got meat prices going up, and you're going to see higher coal cow prices come the first of the year. I'm sure you're already seeing higher concentrate prices today, and you're going to see them even higher. So instead of giving Bessie two scoops of feed, you'll probably cut it down to one and a half right now. And in maybe eight months, it'll be one scoop of feed. And we'll take care of our own excess production. And what excess is, I don't know, because I don't know anybody that's pouring milk down the drain. That's what I consider excess. But it's not going down the drain. It's going somewhere as it's being used. If we had no imports, we would not produce enough milk for the consumption of the people of this, this United States. But still, we have a surplus of milk. Odd things. And the gentleman that came up with all these ideas, Mr. Howard Yort, who's a chief economist of the Department of Agriculture, was awarded a $20,000 incentive bonus this year for coming up with all these bright ideas. Above and beyond the call of duty. But he couldn't take it all because the Department of Agriculture has a rule that no employee can make more than the secretary. And $20,000 would have made him more money than Bob Berglund was making, so he could only take about 16000 of it. So he didn't get it at all. <laughs> so maybe they'll raise the secretary's pay so that the next economist can get the full 20000 I don't know what's going to happen. But we're going to see higher coal cow prices. But we're also seeing... You know it. I see them. We got a lot of young stock out there. Better producers than the old marginal cows is going to go to the hamburger. So we're still going to keep producing milk. But we've been in these situations before. But the final analysis is that the competitive price of milk 
has been higher than support for 26 out of 30 years. What's going to happen after October 1st, I mean after April 1st? They're predicting economists in the Agricultural Outlook Conference held in Washington a couple of weeks ago that milk production this year is going to be between 129 and 131 and a half billion pounds of milk. Again, plus 3% over 1980. 